February 14th, 1929, Chicago, Illinois. It's 6.30 a.m. and the St. Louis man is already up. He's in town for business and he doesn't want to be late. He showered, shaved, ate breakfast, and got dressed in a police uniform. He's in a rented apartment with five other men and they're waiting for a phone call. Shortly before 8 a.m., the call comes and the six men rush out to their cars. A few minutes later, they pull up in front of the SMC Carters Company at 2122 Clark Street and a car made to look like a police vehicle. The man and a partner, also dressed as a police officer, walk into the front door. Minutes later, neighbors hear what they think is a car backfiring in the garage. Then they see two police officers leading two criminals out at gunpoint. They get into the police car and pull off. The incessant howling of a dog caused the curious neighbor to peek into the garage. What they find is no less than a massacre. Six men dead and one dying. When the dying man was asked by police who shot him, he said, the police did it. Hey, you guys, gals, and bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. All right, today we're going to be talking about a man who would win the award for the best all-around criminal if they had one. He was a bootlegger, hijacker, kidnapper, armed robber, bank robber, con man, and a hired killer. I'm talking about Fred Killer Burke. But before we get into this, I need to talk to the gang. All right, a little gang meeting here. Now, you guys that have been here since the beginning know how much time and effort and research goes into these videos. And all that takes time, not to mention the subscriptions I need to get all the information and to make the images. So I can put 30 to 40 hours a week into a 20, 30 minute video. And because I'm not a channel that can drop a video every day, the money I get from YouTube does not justify the time it takes to make the videos. So I'm reaching out to the gang. All right, I need you guys help. I'm opening up the YouTube membership and for just $1.99 a month, you guys can help the boss produce the channel. All right, and I'm really talking to the, the gang here, the hardcore guys, the guys who don't miss any videos and always like and comment. You guys know who you are. I know that 199 is chump change, but if I can get a percentage of my core audience to help out, it will go a long way. And it will allow me to sit and research and get the videos out in a timely fashion. And once I get everything rolling, I'll start to do live post video shows where I could talk with the members and discuss the videos. And we can even go back and talk about some of the older videos, all right? So I really love doing this with you guys, but I'm wearing myself thin trying to do all this and make sure that I can handle my financial responsibilities. So if you think these videos are worth 50 cent a pop, join up and let's make this channel our thing for real, okay? Now back to our regularly scheduled program. The man who would be known as Fred Killer Burt was born Thomas Camp, on May 29, 1893, in Mapleton, Kansas. He was the middle child of eight, and it was said that he was an average student and he went to church every Sunday. While still a child, his mother passed away and Fred began to act up. When he was 15, he was arrested for trying to swindle a traveling salesman in a land fraud scheme. Instead of going to trial, he took off to St. Louis. In St. Louis, he joined up with the Egan's Rats. The Rats were a longtime criminal gang started by Thomas Snake Kenny and Thomas Egan back in 1890. They were an all-around criminal organization. They were union busters, hijackers, armed robbers, kidnappers, and hired killers. In 1917, Fred was arrested on a counterfeiting charge and joined the army to escape a prison term, just as America was entering World War I. Thomas Camp will become Killer Burt on the battlefields of France. He was in the machine gun regiment and also served as a tank gunner. He rose to the rank of Master Sergeant and became an expert machine gunner. After the war, he was honorably discharged and returned to St. Louis. When he returned from the war, he went back to St. Louis where he tried to make an honest living. He worked for a time at a machine shop, but the war had given Fred a set of skills highly sought after by criminal organizations in the 20s. He found that he could make the right money on the wrong side of the law. So by 1923, he was back with the Egan's Rats. On April 26th of 23, he took part in a robbery of the Garrett and Company Distillery in St. Louis. Fred dressed as the police officer, and he and four other men made their way into the distillery, tied up an employee and a security guard. Then they loaded 52 cases of bonded whiskey into the company's own trucks, transported the liquor, and returned the trucks to the warehouse. A former employee was arrested. It was an obvious inside job. The elevator operator's nightly routine was to remove a fuse for the elevator, disabling it, before he went home. The crooks were aware of this, and they brought their own fuse with them and took it with them when they left. 
that score was worth 52 grand on the streets. On July 2nd, 1923, Fred and his Egan's Rats pals walked into the United Railway office in St. Louis. Lucky for them, it was payday. They rushed in and held 30 employees at gunpoint, while others cleaned the paymaster's cage of 38 grand. But in their haste, they overlooked another 50 grand in the back. As they piled into their getaway car, some of the employees fired shots at the car as it sped off. A police officer pulled the car containing seven men over for speed in a few counties away. He wrote them a ticket and sent them on their way. In 1924, most of the leadership of Egan's Rats were convicted of mail robbery after a low-level member spilled the beans on a crime. Some of the remaining members took their operation to Detroit, where they formed a working relationship with the Purple Gang. Johnny Reed was one of those Egan's Rats members who moved to Detroit. He was a bootlegger and he was head of a snatch ring, and more importantly, he was the distributor for the Purple Gang. In the summer of 1926, Mike DePisa, one of Detroit's most shot at gangsters, sent some of his men to shake down Johnny Reed. Johnny didn't appreciate this and he contacted Fred Burke in St. Louis. Fred hopped in his car and headed to the Motor City. On August 11th, two patrolmen witnessed two cars speeding down Broadway engaged in a gun battle. The police gave chase and found one car full of bullets, but no one injured. They arrested Mike DePisa along with two of his men. DePisa reached out to Reed and sued for peace, but it was all a ruse. On December 27, 1926, Johnny Reed was returning to his apartment on East Grand Avenue at 4.30 a.m. As soon as he pulled in behind his apartment, a man stepped from the shadows and shots rang out. A sawed-off shotgun splattered Johnny's hopes and dreams onto the interior of his car. A trail of blood led police to a hallway where his body had been dragged and dumped by the killers. To the press, this was just another gangster killed in Detroit. But to the Purples, they had lost an ally and somebody had to pay. When the Purples reached out to the rats, Fred Burke jumped at the opportunity to get payback for his friend. The Purples found out who was behind the Reed shooting. Frank the Pollock Wright, a gunman from Chicago, was hired by the Pisa to take out Reed. The Purples hatched a plan to put Wright on the spot. The Purple Snatch Wright associate Fish Bloomfield and held him for ransom. Wright was told to come to the Mila Flores apartment building at 106 East Alexandrine Avenue, apartment 308, to pay the money. Frank Wright arrived around 4.30 a.m. along with two of his guys, Reuben Cohen and Joseph Bloom, and they were all packing heat. As they walked down the hall towards room 308, the fire door at the end of the hall suddenly swung open and shots rang out. Fred Burke with a Thompson, Eddie Fletcher and Samuel Axler of the Purples with automatic handguns opened up on the stunt gangsters. Burke almost cut Bloom and Cohen in half with his Thompson. They died on the spot. The neighbors awakened by the gunfire waited a good 10 minutes before they peeked out of their doors and saw three men in a bloody heap in the hallway. Wright was still alive when the police arrived. When they asked him who shot him, all he said was, the machine gun worked fine. He died a few hours later. This was the first machine gun killing in Detroit. With the death of Reed, Fred Burke began to spend more and more time in Detroit. Burke and his Egan's Rat Pals continued their kidnapping operation and it seems that they were not above kidnapping so-called allies. Joe Bernstein, the Purple Gang leader, accused Burke and the Rats of kidnapping Purple Associates or at least people who had paid the Purples for protection. That's hard to say. After a few Detroit gangsters were taken for a ride in their own cars, robbed and tossed out, it seemed that the Purples wanted to send a message. On April 23rd, 1927, Egan's Rats member Teddy Werner, who owned a roadhouse in Louisiana, was in his apartment building that he shared with a younger Bernstein brother, Joe, who was acting as his bodyguard in the Crescent City. Bernstein went to his apartment and went to bed, and Teddy was in his pajamas when the doorbell rang. He answered the door and let three men in. A few minutes later, a scuffle ensued and shots rang out. Teddy was hit six times in the neck and face. Several other bullet holes peppered the floor around his head, indicating that the killers were standing over him when they fired the shots. Bernstein heard the shots and ran to Warner, just in time to see three men speeding off in the car. He fired a shot at the car, but hit nothing. Warner was found with his pistol under his body. Back in Detroit, on July 21, 1927, Five Purples was sitting in the car on Oakland Avenue in Leicester. When the car pulled alongside and shots rang out, Fred Burke leaned out of the window and sprayed the car with his Thompson. Purple gang members Eddie Fletcher, Louis Fleischer, and Sam Drapka were wounded in the attack and 22-year-old gangster Henry Kaplan was killed on the spot. A sit-down between the Purples and the Rats was arranged for September 7th, but Burke and the Rats smelled a rat. So they sent Raymond Shaka, a small-time Chicago bootlegger, to speak on their behalf. Shaka met with two men in the Carlton Plaza Hotel. 
A half an hour later, the cops busted the door down after reports of gunfire. They found Shaka beaten and shot, but alive. He was taken to the receiving hospital where he eventually recovered. On April 16, 1928, Fred and four other men were in Toledo, Ohio. They were in a car with several shotguns and a machine gun mounted on the rear. They forced a mail truck to the curb and they tied the driver and three guards up and took two strong boxes containing $200,000. As they were pulling away, they were noticed by two police officers, George Zientara and John Bukupski. They saw the car speeding off and gave chase. The gang, oblivious to the police, went straight to the rendezvous. Bukupski stayed in the front while Zientra went to the back. When he entered the garage, shots rang out. Fred Burke wasted no time using his Thompson on the young officer, killing him instantly. The gang took off and left the strong boxes behind. By 1928, Detroit was too hot for Fred Burke, so he relocated to Chicago. He was quickly noticed by Al Capone and became a man Al could trust to do his dirty work. In July, Al sent his new toy to Brooklyn to deal with an old pal. Frankie Yale was an old friend of Al's from back in his Brooklyn days. In fact, Al worked for Yale, and it was Yale who sent Al to Chicago after he killed the man. But now, Frankie and Al were on bad terms. Al's booze shipments from Yale began to get hijacked before they ever left Brooklyn. Al suspected his old pal was behind it, so he sent a spy to see if he was correct. His spy was exposed and killed by Frankie, but not before he confirmed Al's suspicion. On July 2nd, 1928, Frankie was in his speakeasy when he received an urgent call. He slammed the phone down and jumped into his new Lincoln and took off down Utrecht Street. As he was driving, a car pulled alongside and shots rang out. A shotgun and a Thompson submachine gun opened up on Frankie. He hit the gas and tried to get away, but the car with Illinois plates kept pace. A burst of fire slammed into the back of Frankie's head. He lost control of the car and crashed into a home on 44th Street. The shooter's car disappeared. This was the first time that a machine gun was used in a murder in New York. In February 1929, Al Capone had another stone in his shoe that he wanted removed. Bugs Moran was the latest leader of the Northside Gang. He had been helping himself to Al's liquor shipments after Al cut off his supply of bond of whiskey. When Capone ally machine gun Jack McGurn was shot by Northside gangsters, a plan was hatched to eliminate the Northside gang once and for all. On Valentine's Day, 1929, the Northside gang was at the SMC Carters Company at 2122 Clark Street, a garage that they used to unload liquor shipments. Bugs Moran told his men to be there to accept the load of stolen Capone booze. Moran stopped to get a shave and was running late, but seven of his men were already in the garage drinking coffee and trying to stay warm. When the police car pulled up out front, two police officers entered the garage. They told the men to put their hands up and get against the wall. While their backs were turned, two more men entered through the back door and then shots rang out. Two Thompson submachine guns roared until the air was filled with brick dust and a bloody mist. A shotgun blast finished off what was left. The four men then walked outside. The two dressed as police officers were behind the other two who had their hands raised as if they were being arrested. They got into the police car and took off. A witness reported that the taller policeman was missing the front tooth. Fred Burke instantly became a suspect. Fred Burke was hiding in plain sight. He lived with a woman in a luxurious bungalow on Lakeshore Drive. He had been involved with a few bank robberies, including a daring daytime robbery of the Jefferson Farmers and Merchants Bank in Jefferson, Wisconsin on November 7th, and he was now going by the name Fred Dane. When he needed to get away from the city, he stayed in the cottage right outside of Muskegon, Michigan. On December 14th in St. Joseph's, Michigan, Fred Burke was celebrating the holidays a little early, and he was driving drunk when he sideswiped the car owned by Forrest Cool. Cool got out and began to argue with Burke. A police officer named Charles Skelly was on traffic duty, and he came over to fix the situation. He ordered both men to go to the police station and fill out a report. But Burke scoffed. He peeled a few bills off his bankroll and tossed a couple bucks in Cool's face and took off. Officer Skelly hopped on the run of of a car and ordered the driver to follow Burke. When they caught up to Burke out of light, Skelly hopped onto the runner board of Burke's car. But before he could even get a grip, shots rang out. Fred reached the 45 out the window and shot the 30-year-old officer in the chest. As he fell, he fired two more shots into his back and side before peeling off. His car would be found several miles away in a ditch after he hit an ice patch, lost control, and lost two wheels on the curb. He fled the scene and ran through the woods until he came across a man named Monroe Wolf sitting in his car. Burke hopped into the car, stuck a pistol in the wolf's ribs, and told him to drive south. After a few miles, Burke became sick and told Wolf to pull over. When Burke got out the vomit, Wolf hit the gas, leaving the bad man stranded. Eventually, he ran into someone he knew and paid them to take him home. The police found a receipt in the car and traced it back to Fred Dane from Lakeshore Drive. 
When the police raided Burke's Lakeshore Drive place, they found his girlfriend, who called herself Mrs. Dane. They told her that her husband was wanted for murder. She was shocked and had no idea what they were talking about. Her husband was a businessman who was out of town for work. When the police asked her what kind of business her husband was in, she said she didn't know. When the police searched the house, they found Burke's arsenal. Two Thompson submachine guns with 500 round drums, five smaller drums, and three 20 shot clips. One machine gun was loaded and ready. The other was in a black suitcase. Two high power hunting rifles, one sawed off shotgun with a pistol grip, 2,000 rounds of 45 ammunition, as well as fruit jars filled with miscellaneous ammunition of all sizes, and a half a dozen tear gas bombs. They also found $319,000 in stolen bonds in the closet. The police then realized that Fred Dane was actually Fred Killer Burke. When police in Chicago found out about Burke's arsenal, they requested that the Thompsons be shipped to them for analysis. The new forensic science that could match bullets with guns showed that both Burke machine guns were used in the St. Valentine's Day murder. The police in Brooklyn then made a request to have the bullets from the Frankie Yale murder tested and one of his guns matched. Then it was Detroit's turn. The bullets from the Mila Flores murders matched. Fred Killer Burke was named the most wanted criminal in the country. But Fred Burke was not going to allow something like a bounty on his head or every cop in the country gunning for him slow him down. He began pulling jobs with some of the heavyweights in bank robbery. Guys like Alvin Creepy Carpus, Machine Gun Kelly, Frank Jelly Nash, and Vern Miller. On November 10, 1930, minor racketeer Thomas Bonner was at his home at 7353 Yale Avenue in Chicago. Fred had pulled a job with Bonner, and after Bonner was seen leaving the police station, several men involved with the crime were arrested. Right before midnight, two men knocked on Bonner's door. He let them in, and an argument quickly started. Bonner's wife, who was in the other room, heard her husband say, You got me all wrong. And then shots rang out. Fred Burke put two 45 slugs in the left side of Bonner's head, and the 400 pound hoodlum dropped to the floor with a heavy thud. Burke and his associate calmly turned and walked out, leaving Bonner's wife in shock, holding the couple's baby. For eight months, Fred Burke stayed one step ahead of the cops. He took a wife and was hiding at his new father in law's farm in remote Milan, Missouri. A local gas attendant named Joseph Hunzinger was reading a detective magazine and he recognized Fred Burke and notified police. On March 26, 1931, five detectives surrounded the farmhouse. They entered and found Burke sleep in the back room. A pistol was on a nightstand next to him and the window was open in case he needed to make a quick getaway. One officer secured the weapon while another kicked the bed. Burke woke up and reached for his gun, but it was not there. Having dressed up as a cop himself, he did not believe that they were officers. When they showed their badges, he relaxed. He was taken in without incident. At trial, Fred Burke pleaded guilty to second-degree murder for the killing of Officer Skelly and avoided being tried for the St. Valentine's Day shooting in Illinois, which carried the death penalty. The judge sentenced him to life with hard labor. When asked if he had anything to say, Burke just said, thank you. Fred Burke went off to do his time in Marquette Prison in Upper Michigan. He was a model inmate and was a foreman in the prison's leather shop. In February 1940, he took the side of the prison and a riot that started in a leather shop after Fred fired another inmate. On July 10th, 1940, Fred Killer Burke woke up dead in his cell of a massive heart attack. He was 47 years old. Some credit Fred Burke with the deaths of up to 21 men throughout his criminal career. And who knows how many Germans he killed in France. And that, my friends, is the skinny on Fred Killer Burke. I hope you guys enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. Make sure you bump off that subscribe button, ring that bell, set up for all notifications so you don't miss nothing, break that thumb, and join the membership if you feel like you can spare two bucks a month to help produce the channel. All right? So, this has been A Few Bad Men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies.